Hello, and welcome to the SciShow Talk Show of the Day on SciShow, where we talk to interesting people about interesting stuff. Today, our interesting person is Steve Running, Regents Professor Emeritus at the University of Montana, which I feel like means you've been a professor, you were a professor for a long time, long enough to sort of become like a legendary status professor. <laughs> and you study the Earth right. broadly. How's yeah. it doing? Um, I've heard. Yeah, we, <laughs> we've we got an awful lot of evidence that things are kind of cracking up. Where is safest? Where should I be? Mon Actually, <laughs> Montana's not a bad place to be, but don't tell the realtors that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the houses have gotten more expensive. Yeah, and, and so you've been studying climate change for, I assume, a long time now. Yeah. And also just ecosystem ecology and et cetera. Right. The job I took when I got here was as a tree biologist. Okay. And so I didn't start with NASA and big global science in the beginning. And I think this is actually a useful thing for your audience to, to recognize is I see so many students get really uh, concerned and worried about picking the right major mm -hmm. to go to college. And I was a darn tree physiologist and I ended up a rocket scientist for NASA. And so you really don't have to choose the rest of your life with your major. And I see all too many students just uh, stressing out over, yeah. over getting the right major. Yeah, I, biochemistry in undergrad and uh, didn't end up using that much. Yeah. But uh, but glad I had it. Yeah. And the thing is, like you, you in whatever profession you end up in, but specifically if you're in the sciences, like you're going to be learning and relearning your whole life. Oh yeah. This stuff is not like when were you a tree physiologist first? 1971. So things have changed since. Then. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, I mean the, there's always new stuff, and you have to be changing or else you're out. Well, when I give uh, lectures to to, uh, especially to students, I like to pull out one of these that every one of you has. And to think that when I was an undergraduate, nobody even dreamed of oh, anything sure. like this. Yeah. Not even the sci-fi movies. And now every one of us has one. And think of the industry that's built up over these, not only building them, but then using them. Mm -hmm. None of that was even dreamed of when I was in college. Sure. Are, are you still doing active research? Yeah, I still have my main NASA grant for the Earth Observing System. What's the Earth Observing System? Sounds, well, is that thought you just point point a camera at Earth and you're like, there it is? I <laughs> know. We hopefully do way more than that. This was the original, started in the late 1980s, called the Mission to Planet Earth. We launched three really big platforms in... Uh, 2000, 2002, and three, and and these are still producing data 20 mm -hmm. years later. Yeah. The taxpayers have really gotten their money's worth on this one. They've lasted and lasted and are still going. And what are you able to, what, what's the kind of data that you get off, off of these? Well, my particular part is I study the biosphere. So in effect, I'm watching plant growth worldwide mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And so I, with some kids, I, I would label it watching the global garden grow. And that is, isn't a bad kind of mental image of what my data set does. Watches worldwide and every it, day. What, does it do that through just like normal visual light photography or is there spectrum? It's effectively yeah. a vis a visible near infrared wavelengths and you're measuring kind of simple reflectance right. of, of the, the ground vegetation. So it's not dramatically different than what a digital camera sees mm -hmm. as, as it looks at a landscape. When I took terrestrial ecosystem ecology back a long time ago at the University of Montana, I uh, was sort of shocked to discover that we do work pretty hard to try and figure out Basically, all of like the production on Earth, like mm -hmm. like basically there are plants, and what is the 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 output of those plants in terms right. of like how much how much light goes into them, how much stuff comes out of them, mm -hmm. how much biomass do they build? Remarkable that we could even think about measuring that on a global scale. Yeah, and you do that. Uh, what are uh, what are the things that you are concerned about? Let's not say global warming first. Okay, sure. <laughs> Let's start by just simply, uh, we use our data set to, to literally understand how much plant growth there is in the biosphere. And uh, of course, the most obvious utility for that is 
is food production. What's mm -hmm. the capacity of the planet to grow food? And how many, how many billion people do we actually think the planet can support? Uh, right. So that's a good first one. Mm -hmm. uh, a second one that's very highly related is can bioenergy actually be a major uh, substitute for fossil fuels? And, and that's those, a and those function two of, things are related to each other because oh, if you're in direct competition yeah, if you're, to with if each you're other, in more fact. more land toward food and yep. more water toward food, that's less water and land toward. Yep, exactly. Fuel. Yeah, and, you know, it's talking about it in terms of land and water is sort of how I think about it. But I think a lot of mm -hmm. people might not think about the water. Like, how far are we from being at max capacity? And what are the things that, because because of course there were times when we thought we were at max capacity and we were wrong. Uh, yeah. You know, we started yeah, fixing nitrogen right. from the atmosphere and suddenly yeah. like, okay, well the carrying capacity of the earth just went up a lot. Yep. Thank you, Fritz yep. Haber, for that part, but not all the other stuff. Right, right. <laughs> right. Now, in, in certain regions, we're really concerned that they're going to literally run out of irrigation water in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. uh, and is much that, of India is that way. Are they bringing up from aquifers? Yeah. yeah. This is groundwater depletion. The Ogallala Aquifer in the Southern Great Plains, uh, they're following that as it's depleted and they know when it hits bottom, all that surface ag is gonna go back to uh, rain-fed agriculture. Mm -hmm. So they're living on, they're literally mining the, the groundwater. One of the things that when you hang around NASA, you just fall into things that are, are amazing. One of our best ways to measure groundwater is with a satellite. Hmm. And I tell people that and they go, what? That is how I feel. A satellite? Yeah. I know the principal investigator of that mission and I had to have him explain it over and <laughs> over again. Remember, I'm a tree biologist. Now tell me again, how does this work? Um, real simply, there's, there's two platforms and what they're measuring is really tiny differences in gravitational pull. And oh. so as groundwater is depleted, the gravity goes down by some tiny little amount that they can measure in space. And so there's papers in the literature now all, all over about uh, measuring groundwater depletion of whole continents with this satellite. It's called GRACE. And how long has it been up there? Like, how, like do we have a, like a graph that goes on over enough time? Oh, it's been up, I want to say something like 10 years. And I think the first satellite might have petered out. Mm -hmm. I've lost track, but uh, we have a multi-year measure mm -hmm. that's allowed them to look at places where they can clearly see depletion. During the California drought, they could see that uh, wow. Central Valley depletion easy. It was huge. Fascinating. And it's really important for those missions to have that continuity. So when a satellite is starting to yep. reach the end of its life, sometimes there are times when we're not 100% sure. Losing a year of data in a situation like that where you're trying to have the continuousness is such a loss. Yeah. Uh, the, the sensor that I work with, I started on in 1982. Mm -hmm. we, we then had a design, had a competition. Congress passed it in 1989. And it wasn't launched till almost the year 2000. Yeah. So there it was, 16, 18 years from concept to launch. And mm -hmm. now we've had 18 years of data on it. Yeah. But the lead time is really big compared to most things people work yeah. on. And I've, I mean, I've heard people sort of pushing back against the idea, like NASA shouldn't be about studying Earth. And I'm just like, oh, God. Yeah, but like... I don't want to say that this is the most important planet, but it is, right? Yeah. Like, you know that this is the important one. That yeah. we, like, it's good to be able to take a step out and look down at this thing oh. that is the whole reason why you breathe and stuff. Come on. <laughs> no kidding. I just endlessly am amazed that uh, uh, people like, and I think they have political motivation, not sure. so much uh, scientific as, as they try to say NASA should not be bothering with studying Earth. It's just so normal and routine. They should be out uh, mm -hmm. studying the stars, which they do anyway. Yeah. But this has been part of the NASA charter forever. Part of it was also to work uh, on studying Earth. So this is mm -hmm. well part of its mandate. Absolutely. Are we going to run out of food? Yeah. It's, it's sort of a fa fascinating that we can ask that question on a global level. But yeah. Like, in general, like looking toward future instability, food, of course, is the is a huge concern. 
Yeah, I, I don't actually think we will any time in the immediate future. And the reason I say that is because an awful lot of agriculture is operating at dramatically less than full efficiency. Hmm. Another thing that just amazes you know, when you hear these statistics, we waste about a third of the food that's grown, we being humanity as a whole, mm -hmm. a third. And I've seen that measured in many, many papers, not just one. So yeah. that isn't just an idle guess. And so we have huge opportunity to manage the food we already grow way better than we do now. Right. And then there's there's other variables, uh, more vegetarian diets, mm -hmm. having less food good of pets, dogs and cats, and more to people if things got tough. That's a really unpopular one, but it's <laughs> real. It's, part, it's one of the variables. Yeah. So I don't see running out of food being anything right. immediate. That isn't to say that our entire food system isn't going to have to get smarter in a lot of ways. Right, and, and sometimes what you see is, of course, it, it things get more expensive before they become not available. Right. And that is a problem. Like, we don't want food to get more expensive because we want people to have income to spend on things other than just, <laughs> you know, calories. Oh, Americans spend less on food than about any other country. And and far less than less, we used to. Yeah. It's, a, it's extremely inexpensive, yeah. a lot of the food that we eat, because it's so efficient in this yep. country. So obviously there's a lot to say about climate change. Often I ask different people, like, what's the thing about climate change that concerns you most? And I get d different answers. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like ocean acidification. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even think about oh, geez. that. Yeah. And there's, and there's, I think the average person is like, sea level rise, right? That's the thing mm -hmm. to worry about. But I, I'm, I'm curious on, about your take. Well, the global change scientists, my friends and I that spend our whole life working on this, we're pretty unanimous that probably the biggest damage to humanity worldwide will be sea level rise because mm -hmm. so much of the population of the world are on big cities on the coasts. And that's, that's a pretty strong consensus mm -hmm. that that's going to do more damage and it's going to be less reversible right. and, uh, and we're going to just have no choice uh, than to deal with it. And it's already on the way. Yeah. Of course, you know how we measure that. A satellite. Yeah. We've got a laser <laughs> altimeter that measures to about that kind of accuracy from the, space, s from space <laughs> the sea level. Uh, it's really cool hanging around yeah. those NASA rocket scientists. You just yeah. are you regularly amazed. And I have to pretend I'm not amazed because I'm part of the club. <laughs> but I'm actually quietly thinking, how did they ever figure that out? Right. What they, am I just, doing here? Just the general, how did I get in a room with these people? No feeling that I we think all that have. at NASA headquarters yeah. all the time. Yeah. I really do. That's great. So what is, <laughs> how did you end up there? Like what was the path from tree physiologist to NASA headquarters? In abbreviated yeah, form. Yeah, abbreviated, not <laughs> 40 years worth. Turned out that when I was an undergraduate, I had a professor who not only was thinking in systems ecology, but thought that this computer programming might be a good skill. And so mm. what got me into NASA was Fortran programming. <laughs> okay. So I was one of the one of the very first ecologists yeah. that could think about how to translate ecology into a computer program mm -hmm. with simulation modeling. So that's what got me in the door. And, and of course, uh, simulation modeling becomes all of yeah. ecology. Well, of, of large-scale ecology. Right. Yeah. Uh, the global scale, what else are you going to do? Yeah. yeah, you have a, a few set of uh, satellite data streams and the whole rest of this integration and synthesis mm -hmm. is computer modeling. So that was that was what got me in the door. Nice. Fortran, not super useful anymore? You know, there is still <laughs> heritage code <laughs> yeah. running in Fortran oh, man. that do things like mission operations for satellites. Uh, the other thing that I want to say back to, to sea level rise is... Uh, the thing to remember is what can't we move? Yeah. You can move a farm. Like you can start yeah. farming different areas. You can. Canada is going to mop up. Yeah. And they have a lot of arable, great cropland there already. Yeah. But if it gets warmer. It's going to get better. Growing um, season's getting longer up there. But uh, you can't move a city. Yeah. Like we've, the infrastructure yep. is there and that's yep. going to, and, and it's easy to think of like New York, but you also have to think of like everyone in Florida. Yeah. There's oh, a lot geez. of people there. Yeah. 
and, we're all of Bangladesh. And, and I have a friend who's an ecologist who who sent me a paper that terrified me. That wasn't mm-hmm. how much sea level is going to rise. It was both here's the rise that we expect by by 2100 or mm-hmm. something. But here's how much we've signed up for it by that point. Yeah, because oh, of course yeah. you put an ice cube on the table, yeah. it doesn't melt immediately. Right. So yeah, the sea level is rising, but if even if we stay at that exact same temperature, that ice cube's gonna melt over right. the next hundred years. Yep. And that's a really scary number because you know if you're having a kid right now, that kid's gonna be around 80 yep. years from now. And that's 80 years from now. We're... Pr- Probably expecting three feet of sea level rise by the end of this century, by 2100. Oof. Three feet. And as you say, that also bakes into probably another five or even 10 feet mm-hmm. by 2300. Yeah. And that's, and then, and then by 2300, you've got the other yeah. baked in. Um, and this is, I mean, we've seen change in the geological record. We've seen right. change on that level, and it's not good. Like when change on that that's, level occurs, it's, it's quite it's, disruptive. It's quite disruptive. To whoever the local crowd is at the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whether it's trilobites or people. That's right. All right, well, let's, uh, speaking of animals, let's see, <laughs> let's see an animal that will uh, hopefully skate out the next right. few hundred years without too much trouble. Hey, Jesse. Hey, this is uh, not a trilobite, but. No, it's a, some kind of reptile. And it looks like I feel like you could do okay in a world with a lot less water. Well, you might think so, but there what? are some pretty interesting studies going on. This is Bindi the bearded dragon, <laughs> and uh, he's a, he's a fairly old guy, so he he's Bindi just mean that chills. you're from Australia? Yes, from Australia. All right. So reptiles in general are getting pretty hit pretty hard by climate change, and because they are an ectothermic animal, they rely on mm-hmm. temperatures um, a lot more than endothermic mm-hmm. animals, and so you would think, and scientists were hoping that with the the trend of warming up in a lot of places, they were excited. They were thinking, maybe maybe reptiles are going to do great, you know? <laughs> yep. More warmth, more activity. Um, we'd see some cool evolution going on. And pretty much the opposite is happening. So it's huh. heating up too fast. Right. They're not adapting fast enough. And so some of the main studies are figuring out you know, why there's these mass extinctions going on. And they, they're just multiple extinctions every year on reptiles. And so it's what they're studying is reptiles will wake up in the morning, they'll go out to bask. Mm-hmm. They warm up, then they mm-hmm. start hunting. It's too hot, they go and hide. So if it gets fast quickly, they're going out, and as soon as they're out there basking, they're already overheated, and they have to mm-hmm. go and find shade. And they don't have any time to hunt, yeah. mm-hmm. and then you know they can't sustain themselves, and then they can't reproduce, and then yeah. you know, they're, they're either starving or, or they're just not reproducing, and that generation is, is dying off. So we just send them all to zoos. Yeah. And there you go. It's yeah, your so let's uh, deplete fine. biodiversity completely, right? <laughs> One of the things we measure with our satellites is the surface temperature. Yeah. And it's unbelievable. In the middle of the day in full sun, you can have 150 degree surface temperatures. And so yeah. I can imagine exactly what you're saying, that yeah. they come out and it's heating up too fast yep. and they just can't, Nothing really yeah. can live in 150 degree temperature. No, and some reptiles they need to get up to 120, 130 to digest well, but that's that's a few. But yeah. 150, that's yeah. that's yeah, too that's much. A, that's a that's a hot. I was just thinking about that time I was on the beach and I couldn't handle it. Yep. I bet it wasn't Way anywhere near 150. No. That one time I was on a beach. <laughs> hey, the astroturf at the football stadium. Yeah, we've measured at 140. What? Yeah. Here? Yeah. Uh, Urban deserts. You know, a reptile can, they can yeah. go out and then they can dart into shade and come back out and dart into shade. Yeah. But that's only if they have a lot of places to find yep. shade, mm-hmm. um, not just these big expanses. So how that relates to bearded dragons is mm-hmm. um, these guys are easy to study because they breed really well in captivity. And so you can get a lot of them. And what they wanted to figure out was, you know, how how are these warming temperatures affecting these guys. And uh, they're a fun reptile to study because they have this cool ability to learn by mimicry. Hmm. So, you know, not too long ago, we thought only primates could do that, right? What? What do you but mean? these guys, so they <laughs> they can watch another bearded dragon do something, okay. and then they can do it where they might not be able to figure that out by trial and error. Mm-hmm. They would be able to just watch someone else. Uh, oh, oh, that's how you do it. Uh, 
So that's a really cool thing about these guys. So they did a study. I just these scales They're on the cool, side. They're cool, aren't they? You want to touch like them? Pokey pokes. They look like so he's hard up there, but those look really pokey. But they're not. They're they're actually no, attached. they're pretty soft. Yeah. They're just attached yeah. to like this wobbly skin, so they just yeah. move all over the place. Okay, so the study that they did on these guys was they took a clutch and they kept, they incubated it one half of the clutch at normal, like 82 degrees. That's mm -hmm. pretty normal temperature um, in Australia where these guys are from. And then they took the other half of the clutch and they put it a little higher at 86 degrees. And they both hatched and then they did cognition studies on them. So they all got to watch a, a video <laughs> of a bearded dragon <laughs> doing a task and it was opening, sliding a door open to get some food. And they found out that the ones that were incubated at normal temperature learned quicker and were able to get it. <laughs> Where the ones that were heated up, they either couldn't figure it out or it took them way longer. So, of course, it's, it's, it was a small wow. study, so they need to do it more and more and yeah. more. more but, uh, so it's the, hot, the hotter the earth gets, the dumber they're the dumber. Beer the <laughs> they're gets. Dumber. Well, it's true with people. It is. <laughs> yeah, Florida. <laughs> I'm from Florida. It's okay for me to say that. <laughs> you get to say that. <laughs> so that study, uh, it just tells us that we need to, to study them more and, um, you know, repeat that study and see if we get the yeah. repetition of it. You want to tromp around? What do you think? You want to hold him? Sure. Uh, my roommate in college had a bearded dragon. Yeah. So I know all about what you eat and what mm -hmm. the things that you eat smell like. <laughs> 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 They shouldn't smell bad. Crickets. Oh smell yeah, bad. you're right. Cricket poop smells bad. <laughs> yeah, cricket. Crickets. Oh, and themselves. smash cricket smells bad too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You yeah. want to eat crickets because that's another what food source. Yeah. yeah. I just want to create a yeah. world where salmon aren't going to go extinct <laughs> because I that's love good. them. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you like to pet them or you like to eat no, them? No, I like yeah. to eat them. <laughs> 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 and every time I every time I eat salmon, I think to myself, Do you want to hold them? I should enjoy yeah. this while I can. Flat hands? Can't enjoy it before you can't anymore. Yeah. So, Benny the Bearded Dragon, um, a lot of people are going to want to know a little bit more about bearded dragons. These guys do come from Australia, and they have these awesome adaptations of looking like a terrible thing to eat. Yeah, um, yeah, looking spiky, even <laughs> if they aren't. Yeah, well, I mean, some of these get pretty spiky, and if you're, like, trying to bite this thing, right. it's going to be a lot different than, like, doing a little Should pet. Should I try? Right. I don't. Okay. Um, so, um, to also deter a predator, so it's like, I look really terribly, I'm going to hurt you. If you were to threaten them, they would stand up on their, on their legs, their beard or under their mm -hmm. chin would turn dark black, mm. and then they would open their mouth and hiss at you a little bit, so, <laughs> and then if you come closer, <laughs> they're going to do a head bob, which is cool, so they'll be like, yeah. Bring it on. Like, uh, I'll bite you in the face. Like, <laughs> right? Just like the, just like the tiny lizards in Florida. They're yeah. always doing uh, that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then if that doesn't scare you away, they're they're smart enough to be like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm outmatched. So yeah. they're going to turn tail and run as fast as they can, and they're going to try and wedge themselves into like a little rock crevice, mm -hmm. and then they'll bloat themselves, so they'll puff their body out. And then I want you to try something. I'm going to go ahead and take him back. So pet down his back like that. Go ahead. Kind of bumpy, yeah. right? Okay. Now try and pet backwards. Oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, it's like Velcro it. sort of yeah. thing, isn't yes, it? Yes, exactly. If you go against the grain, it's suddenly yeah. really sharp. Nothing's happening and there. Can't. Yes. So if they wedge themselves into a rock crevice, oh. bloat themselves, and something tries to pull them out, it, it just gets, it, doesn't well. it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And then they have to, when the danger is gone, they'll leave. I know. <laughs> he liked it a little. A little huff at me. So that's how they're going to protect themselves. Oh, yeah. Um, Bindi here was a, a rescue. Uh, she, we thought it was a girl at first. So that's why I'll say she every once in a while. He was so small when we first rescued him that, and that we thought he was like six month old when mm. really they said they had bought him two years ago at a pet store. Mm. So it had been over two years. He was over two years old. He had an underbite, um, a He does look a little like, different from other bearded dragons to me. He looks different. His eyes are a little poofy. Yeah. His nostrils are a little poofy. Okay, I thought I was... He <laughs> walks weird because his legs yeah, are actually his, fused to his yeah, bones. His... He has metabolic bone disease. Oh, so gee. he didn't get UV light and he didn't get vitamin D um, and all the nutrients that he needed. He was being fed once every two weeks. These guys should be fed every day, um, different things every day. Um, so he was, he survived. So yeah. These guys are very hardy. He survived, but he definitely has a lot of challenges and he probably won't live as long as, as other bearded dragons, but uh, he's, he's still doing pretty good. It's okay, Bindi. We all die. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, we do. We do. So he can't climb. Um, can't like grab things and climb things. So we give him little ramps and he walks around. And, <laughs> and he's a he's a pretty guy. Um, a lot of them can be a little bit grayer and it's going to blend a little mm-hmm. bit better with the, yeah, the sand mm-hmm. there um, and dirt. But he's like a, bright orange. Some yeah. some sort of color va- mutation variation that they they bred into him. Hey, um, thanks, Bindi, for coming yeah. on my show. It's been a pleasure to stroke you. And ooh, you're getting ooh. puffy. I shouldn't have said <laughs> that word. Which ooh. honestly, maybe I shouldn't have. Jesse, <laughs> yes. thanks for coming on. If you want to <laughs> check out what Jesse's up to, Jesse runs a wonderful animal rescue here in Montana. It's a YouTube channel that we help produce. YouTube.com slash Animal Wonders Montana. Thanks, Inc. You can learn all kinds of cool stuff. And yeah, Steve, thank you so much for coming and sharing and freaking us all out. Ha <laughs> it's <laughs> my stuff job. Stuff we need to know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys for watching this episode of SciShow Talk Show. It's always a great time, and I really appreciate people who stick around for these longer, interesting things. Thank you. 